Well, they say that the, uh, it, on safari in Africa, one of the most dangerous places is to be between a hippo and the water. I think it's also pretty dangerous to be between a whole bunch of conference attendees in their weekend. So I'm going to make sure that keep this uh, moving quickly and hopefully hit some really important topics for you, all about engagement. Uh, you got my sort of formal introduction. I wanted to just take a minute to introduce myself a little bit more expansively. Uh, just some fun facts about me. I was born in Ethiopia. People often will come up to me and say, John, why were you born in Ethiopia? And I like to say that I wanted to be close to my parents. <laughs> um, I can dislocate my thumb at will, dislocated back in. That has nothing to do with marketing. Um, perhaps more to do with marketing is the fact that I have an undergraduate degree in physics. So we just heard about people entering marketing as a psych major and an English major. Well, I come to marketing by way of quantitative left brain, hardcore number physics. But I was also on the debate team and newspaper staff. So I sort of learned how to be good with numbers and learned how to create content and write. And without intending it, I think that ultimately led me to have arguably the best possible preparation for a career in marketing today. I have two children. My uh, older son, Beckett, was born the same month that we incorporated Marketo. And that means it's really easy for me to keep track of how old the company is. Uh, I am at John Miller on Twitter if you want to share any fun facts that I'm about to share. I'll even give you some tips along the way of what I think you should share for those of you who are a little lazy. One final point. Uh, I, I do write a bunch of definitive guides. This is my most recent one, which is the definitive guide to engaging email marketing. I have a couple to give away during the course of the presentation. It's 155 pages, chock full of useful in tips on engagement marketing. Uh, so let's begin by, you know, who, who came here from far away? Anybody here from Europe? You got one? All right, come on up and get your book. <clears throat> we'll do a couple more of these as, as we go. Uh, but you came the farthest and probably have the furthest to head back, so enjoy for the airplane. <sighs> um, I'm not going to tell you much, you know, do a Marketo commercial. I've just sort of gone through this presentation a couple times to get to the end. And people will say, so, you know, what does your company do? Uh, so we're a marketing automation software platform in the cloud. Uh, that's enough said on that. So to set the foundation for why engagement marketing, especially in a B2B context, which is what I'm going to be covering today, you know, I do think it's important just to remind you, I'm sure you've heard it a lot over the last day and a half, that we used to live in a world of information scarcity. If you wanted to buy ERP software or marketing automation software or research a new healthcare plan, buy a new car, the main way you got that information was to talk to a representative of the company. And so marketing you know, was relatively easy. You got your, pushed your message to somebody. If they expressed some interest, you handed it to a salesperson. Buyers expected it. Salespeople expected it. But it's obviously a very different world today. I don't need to remind you how the internet changed everything. But it is worth, perhaps, just you know, revisiting how much this has changed recently. You know, when we started Marketo back in 2006, the iPhone didn't exist, right? Facebook was still for college students. Twitter was still a feature of some company called Odeo, right? So this, this world we live in today where any of you can answer any question you want any time and share the answers with your friends, it's relatively a recent phenomenon, but it's having truly profound impacts in terms of how we market to our customers. It means customers are delaying engagement with sales, so we need to be smarter about how we reach them early on with great content like we just heard. And it's making it harder and harder and harder to reach customers. I think, you know, for many customers, this is what the world looks like today, right? Where they're just being bombarded and overwhelmed with different marketing messages. So Superpower uh, is a you know, analysis firm. They said that the average American consumer is exposed to just under 3,000, 2,908 marketing messages each and every day. And that they only pay attention, though, to 52. That's a huge drop off, right? Because people are pretty good at not paying attention to stuff. What's worse, they don't remember even just a fraction of the 52. So, you know, let's do a little quiz. You know, next, next book giveaway. How many of those 52 messages do you think the consumer remembers the next day. Oh, and before you answer, I just want to say, this is one of my favorite parts in the presentation, because almost every, when you give away a book, right, almost everybody looks up from their phone. 
right? And they, they pay attention, at least for this one single piece. So, so how many of the 52 messages do you think people remember the next day? Any volunteers? I saw one in the back, in the white. Just yell it out. Three. three. It's a little bit more than three, but close. Less than that. We're getting... Well, we're less than five. More than three. All right. <laughs> So that's, you know, what's the answer? Of course, I didn't hear the answer. So can somebody who yelled four just come up and claim their book, please? Go in once. Come on, somebody make a move. Free book. All right, we got one. So yeah, they only remember four messages of the 52. So the question is, if you're a marketer, right, all, the 2,908 messages is the water. Right, that's the water that's spitting around our customers. And their brains like the sponge, and they're only going to remember four messages. So the question we all need to ask ourselves anytime we're doing any marketing is how can I make sure that my message is going to be one of the four? Because if not, I'm wasting my time. Right? And fundamentally, the thesis of this presentation is that if you want your message to be one of the four that gets remembered, you need to be more engaging. Right? You need to have, you know, your marketing needs to feel less like pushing messages and more like, you know, a relevant conversation. This is the only stock art I use in the presentation, but I chose it because I actually do feel like these women are interested in hearing what the other person has to say. They're having a conversation, they're listening, they're responding, it flows from one to the next. And I think that's what we want to aspire all our marketing to be. So this presentation is going to cover five key themes of how marketing is evolving and how Marketo is using our, doing our own marketing in response to this you know, need to be more engaging, you know, in terms of our marketing. So these are kind of the five aspects of, of, I think, modern engagement marketing. So we'll go through each of these. The first is durable conversations. That fancy effect there is called vortex, for any of you who, you know, want to sort of do the same on your own PowerPoints. So durable conversations. This is probably my favorite image in the presentation. You know, think about, you know, most, you know, traditional you know, marketing, what people are doing today. They're running campaigns, right? They're doing, you know, batch and blast, you know, emails. In Europe, they talk about e-shots. Even at Marketo, sometimes we talk about we're going to hit the database, right? What all these terms have in common is that they're arguably militaristic, right? They are about pushing your message, you know, onto somebody. They're not about having an engaging conversation. Right? And I think that is an important mindset change. We need to move away from thinking about blasting messages out because, you know, honestly, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, boy, I hope I get blasted today unless they're planning to go out to the bars. Right? But at least in terms of marketing, nobody wants to get blasted. It hurts. It doesn't feel good to be on the recipient you know, of a blast. These are the tweetable cheat cheats that I mentioned I might have throughout the presentation. We need to move from a world, right, so when you're doing the batch and blast, right, it ends up feeling a little bit like this, especially if all you're sending out is, you know, are you ready to buy and not any of that pre-funnel content that we, we, heard, we heard about. You know, even if you're doing drip marketing, when it's like this, it's going to feel more like water torture to your customers. And what you want is it to feel a little bit more like this that engaging conversation that, that those two women were having before, where they were listening, responding, you know, reacting. It's a move away from a campaign model and into a conversational model. So duh. <laughs> of course we should be doing this. So why aren't more marketers doing this? Right? Why, why are so many companies still doing batch and blast? I think, honestly, it's, you know, as a technology vendor, it is a limitation of the technology more than anything else. Right? Email tools grew up out of the direct mail, direct marketing world. They were all about sending lots of messages to people at once. They weren't built for the conversations. And then there's been a whole set of tools that have evolved that try to say, well, all right, let's not do a bat, batch and blast. Let's kind of map out the diagram of what we want the conversation to look like, like on a whiteboard or a Visio flow. And so you start doing something that like, looks like this. I'll send the email, then if they respond, I do this. If I don't, I'll do that. But, you know, I've been doing this stuff now for 15 years, and what I've found is that that starts simple, but it quickly gets very complex. Customers do things you don't expect, so you have to add more branches to the Visio. Imagine going to a cocktail party, 
and having every single thing that you want to say scripted out in advance, right, on a Visio diagram, right? That's, it's not realistic, because people are going to do, you know, people are going to talk about things you didn't expect. Things are going to happen. And when you try to take all that into account with a Visio diagram, it ends up looking like this, which is really hard to manage, really hard to maintain, and ultimately ends up looking like this. So just for fun, we actually grabbed a video of a customer who was really trying to build out a conversation using kind of a Visio style diagram. So we, we, caught, we caught that on camera. Let's take a look. You know, put, put, it, put it another way, I believe that when you're trying to automate these conversations, flow charts don't flow, right? They end up being too confusing, too complicated and flexible. And ultimately what you want is to think f first about just, you know, the aspects of truly what is an engaging conversation, right? First and foremost, the messages flow from one to the next to the next, right? This goes back to my point earlier. Don't think of your marketing as a batch and blast. Too many marketers think of their marketing as a candy machine, right? I'm going to do something and out are going to come leads, or I'm going to do this campaign and out will come revenue, right? That's not how marketing works, right? It needs to be a communication supply chain, right? Messages flow one to the next, but then as I also said, you need to listen, and that's the key part. You can't branch everything out in advance. It has to have some way to sense what people are doing and then respond appropriately. Which brings me then to topic number two, which is getting smart about tracking and listening to people's behaviors. So to, to set up that point, I think first and foremost, you know, it's really important to just reiterate the value of segmentation in your communications. I, I, this is, I love this research. Uh, what we did is we correlated you know, thousands of email sends. The bottom axis is the size of the send on a logarithmic chart. So how many people got sent that message? And then the vertical axis is something that we call the engagement score. This is a metric that our data science team came up with that ultimately combines opens and clicks and conversions on the good side and unsubscribes and so on on the bad side to come up with a single number of ultimately just how engaging was that email sent. And you see that there's a, there's a direct relationship. Smaller sends are more engaging. What truly blows me away about this for any of the other statistically minded folks out there is that the R squared on this curve is over point two, it's like 0.236. So arguably that means 23% of the engagement of an email send, a full 23% is explained by the size of the send alone. And when you think about all the things that make an email engaging, the subject line, the content, the offer, the creative, the design, that fact that 23% of engagement is described only by the size of how many people you're sending to me is astounding. Right? And what's going on with that is that there's a correlation. When, when your sends are smaller, you can make all the other stuff better. You can make it all more relevant. right? Because if you're sending to 100,000 people, you can't be relevant saying the same thing to everybody. If you take that same list and chop it up into, you know, 10 segments of, of 10,000, you can just be more relevant if your segmentation is good. So segmentation is important. And the smaller your email send, the more engaging it will be. Pretty straightforward. Then you get into how do you make your sends smaller and more relevant. And, you know, I just wrote a blog post about this yesterday. You know, it's pretty common to use demographic segmentation. Right? If they're old, I'm going to send them an email, sorry, older, I'll send them a picture of an email with some older folks. And if they're a millennial, the picture will include some younger folks. But, you know, that's fine. You should do that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, the demographic information, knowing who people are, tells you what they might be interested in. But knowing what they've done, their actual behaviors, tells you what they really are interested in. And that's why this research from Marketing Sherpa, for those of you who can't read the details in the back, shows that the top two ways that people are looking to increase their email engagement is through real-time behaviorally triggered emails and then behaviorally segmented batch emails. Right, 39%, 37%. Behaviors matter to make your emails more relevant. So to illustrate the point further, let me show you an example of something that we've done ourselves at Marketo. So we have a variety of lead nurturing tracks. 
So if you get into our database and you're a marketer, right, and you're not ready to buy yet, that's fine. We're going to send you some relevant, interesting pre-funnel information, you know, every two weeks or so. That's about how to be a better marketer, not about why to buy Marketo. So that's good, right? But then we also are watching your behaviors. So if you attend an event that's about social media, we're going to say, huh, maybe you're more interested just in social media. Or if you download the definitive guide to engaging email marketing, we're going to think, huh, maybe you're more interested in email marketing. So as we watch these specific behaviors, we put you into what we call a topic of interest track. This is going to drip out information to you that's just specific to that topic that your behaviors have said you're interested in. And we'll do that for a few weeks. And then when that kind of runs out, then we just put you back into the regular track. So it's not rocket science, what we're doing here, but it's had really profound effect on engagement. These topic of interest tracks get about a 50% higher open rate, a 50% higher click to open rate, which translates into a whopping 147% higher clicks. You know, more people engaging with our content, um, which I think is pretty cool, right? And that's the only difference between these tracks is the behavior of segmentation, listening and then putting them to the right track accordingly. So what I'm talking about here fundamentally is using all the behavioral information that you have in your enterprise to make your email better, right? What emails are they opening and clicking, right? That alone can help you segment your future emails better. Tie that into the website. What pages do they visit? What links do they click? What keywords do they use when they navigate to your site? What content do they share socially? Huge sign, right, of what they think is interesting, if they actually think it's worth sharing with their friends. Campaign information, like I mentioned, what events do they attend? What other campaigns are they responding to? And then at the most basic, their transactions, right? Obviously, if somebody's bought product X, take that into account in your segmentation, you know, and targeting and so on. Uh, uh, you know, fundamentally what I'm talking about here, right, is having every company market like Amazon does. They do an amazing job of looking at your behaviors and making their marketing be more relevant to you. And I think that's the key point, because sometimes when I talk about all this behavioral tracking, people get worried about privacy, right? But like, aren't you, you know, maybe crossing the line and going t too creepy when you're using all these behaviors? And so it is important to point out, you know, don't be creepy. Right? Don't, you don't want to tell the world, look, I have all this information about you, and because I know so much about you, this is why I'm sending you X. Right? That's creepy. Just do better marketing based on all the information you have. That's what Amazon does. And I think increasingly, buyers expect this, right? especially the millennials. They know we have a ton of data about them. Right? And they kind of expect that they'll share it in return for better, more relevant marketing. And I think you know, that's just an important mindset shift to worry less about the privacy and more about the relevance. So the key takeaway from all this is behavioral targeting equals good. So the third sort of transformation that I wanted to talk about is sort of the move towards exploding um, and integrated channels, right? It's, it's no surprise, you've heard it time and time out throughout this presentation, buyers today are living in a multi-channel world. Right, they're interacting over social, mobile, the web, online, offline, you name it. But according to Experian, less than 10% of companies feel like they're properly um, executing in a cross-channel view. And the problem is two kinds of silos. Right? We have organizational silos. We have them at Arketo. I'm sure you have them. Right? There's a web team, and there's a social team, and then there's the people who send emails. Right? And then you also have technology silos. Well, I have an ESP, and that sends my email. And then I have you know, this other social tool over here. Right? And fundamentally, the customer doesn't care about our silos. Right? <laughs> the customer wants that integrated channel experience. It's incumbent upon us to put an overlay on, a management channel that thinks about the customer experience and then works with the silos and brings the technology tools together to create that coordinated customer experience. So now another topic that comes up sometimes where I really want to go with this, when I talk about um, multi-channel, is people sometimes bring up, well, isn't email dead? 
right? Especially for the millennials, right? You know, do you know? So they want to be on social, right? They want to you know do you know be on you know Vine or whatever. Email's just going away as a channel. So you know, just two two points to make on that. A few years ago, the Wall Street had a journal. Uh, the Wall Street Journal had an article about email being dead because of social, and ironically, it was the most emailed article of the day. Right. Now, second of all, here's another quiz for, for another book, and this is where I need you to be honest. Right? How many people here are willing to admit that since I've started this presentation, you've checked your email? All right, and that, almost half the hands up, especially the folks in the back. Right? So can one of the millennials in the back who said they, they checked their email, come on and get your book? Who wants it? Millennials are shy, they don't want to come up all the way from the back. Come on, all right, we got one, or you just stand, all right, come on down. <laughs> So here's an email checker, all right? She checked her email during the presentation, as did more than half of you. So that suggests that perhaps I need to be more engaging, but I don't think that's actually what's going on, right? I think what's actually going on is you are all engaged with your email, and email is truly not dead, right? Email is fundamentally a really important channel, right? And it's one of the channels that, unlike almost every other channel that we have in the world in, to communicate with customers, it can be used for stuff that's important. Right? If you have something you really need to say to somebody, you're not going to tweet them. You send them an email. Right? And that means that email ends up being what we call the digital glue. And I know you can't read the words on the slide. Um, the, the key point is there's a whole bunch of experts all saying email is the digital glue. Email is the channel that brings all these other channels together. You can't sign up for a social network without an email address. Right? So email brings all these things together and lets you push messages out to people. This is a, um, an analogy I actually really like. You know, email and social are like Batman and Robin, right? Email is like Batman's a little older, maybe a little wiser, has been around, you know, longer, but, you know, really gets, you know, the job done, but better with the young upstart to help him out, right? And so I think there are three ways that we see companies kind of having email and social work together. Sort of the most basic is just social connecting, Right? Just telling your email list to follow you on social. Right? Just at the bottom of your email address, you have a little follow us type of thing. And you can be more sophisticated. Social sharing is when you can encourage your email recipients, people who get your newsletter or your email busts, to say, hey, share this message. Right? So if you liked this article I just emailed you, share it. And then social promoting is actually using social to amplify the message that you might be sending out over email as well, so you get more effect. To explain that last point, let me give you an example of something we've done ourselves at Marketo. So we've done a, a we do city tours, right? We heard SAP is doing that. We do it ourselves. So like a 12-city event of conferences, you know, much like this one, promoted by email. We, so we send the people uh, who we know in our database an invitation. If they register for the event, right, they then get taken to this page, which says, thank you for registering. You thought it was worth attending. Why don't you share it with your social network to invite to see if they want to come? And if you get more than three people to register off of your unique URL, want we'll you into a lottery for a $500 gift card. Right? So just this is what it looks like to kind of set it up and manage it in our tool. But because you know we have everybody has that unique URL, we're able to track exactly what's going on, and the results are pretty astounding. So 13% of everybody who registered also shared. So that's a pretty good registration rate. Um, but to me, what's, what's really cool is we had 363 incremental registrations, or 16% more registrations for our tour that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise if we'd only done the email promotion. Right? So 363 registrants for 500 bucks, that's pretty cool. Right? For anybody who runs an event, you know, that, that's, that's a really good, good cost effectiveness. Fundamentally, what we're talking about here is using then social to get a lift on everything else that you're doing, right? Don't run social campaigns. Make every campaign social. Add a social aspect to encourage your audience to share the message to get more of. And I think that, that is fundamentally one of the real powers of social because at the end of the day, you know, people aren't on social networks to hear from companies, typically. They're on social networks to hear from their social network. Right? And if you can tap into that by having your audience share your message, you're going to be just more using social more in line with how social is meant to be. 
Okay, so the fourth topic is about scoring and prioritizing interest. You know, what's going on with this, I think, is that these buyers, you know, we, in this world of information abundance, buyers don't want to talk to salespeople until they are, quote unquote, ready to buy further along in their buying cycle. So how do you know? How do you know who should be getting just regular nurturing and who should actually be getting a sales contact? So we think of scoring as the way to solve that, where you're going to rank your customers or your prospects in terms of the likelihood of having the behavior you want, right? Are they ready to make a purchase? And so I, I believe passionately that there should be three kinds of lead scoring, and you need all three to be really effective. The first is fit. So fit is, you know, am I interested in you? Are you the right kind of person at the right kind of company who could purchase my product? Interest is, goes the other way. It's like, are you interested in me? Right? Are you engaged with us? Right? And like any real relationship, and you imagine going to the bar and trying to like, meet somebody, right? it's only going to work if I'm interested in you and you're interested in me. So you need both sides. But even then, that's not enough, right? Because I could like you and you could like me, but you could be married, which means the timing's all wrong. Right? So you also have to look at a third dimension, which is, where are, is that person actually ready to make a purchase? Are they in the right part of the buying process? When you have all three of these, then I think you have the right kind of scoring. So we look at the fit stuff just by on the demographics, right? Who, you know, what, what industry you're in, what company you're at, and typically we can get that with data augmentation services in the cloud, like data.com or, or ReachForce. But behaviors, this is a theme we're coming back to, interest and, and buying intent, we're tracking based on your behaviors. Not what you say, but what you do, right? And so to track interest, we're saying, hey, are you reading a blog? Are you going to the website? You know? And then we've also learned things like, well, sometimes people end up with a really high score right? because they've been all over their website and they're downloading everything. But what they're doing is they're preparing for a job interview. So then you want to take points away if they go to the careers page. So you can kind of manage that and so, and so on. But then the buying intent stuff I think is the most interesting. This is the stuff that we've actually shown a correlation with that when somebody does this, they actually move into a buying cycle with us. So going to our pricing page, watching our detailed demos, um, even the keywords they use right, are interesting, right? So if somebody searches for the word digital camera or marketing automation, they're doing research. But if you search for the Canon EOS 6D or the word Marketo, you're further along in your buying process, right? You're much more likely to be, you know, perhaps in a buying stage. So we track all these scores, and then you know, this is one way you can combine them to figure out who should you call. Right? Fit is you know, kind of how, how qualified they are. Two types of interest. So fundamentally, to us, somebody becomes a lead if they're a good fit, and they have either some buying intent or lots of engagement. Once that happens, then this is what it looks like in the CRM system. The stars show the fit. The flames show the urgency, the, the buying intent. And then what we do is we expose what we call interesting moments to the sales rep. So that way they know what behaviors this person has had. What have they done? And again, it's all about being relevant. So that salesperson has the insight in the history so that they you know, oh, this person has been downloading social content and attending social events. I need to talk to them about social, right? And it's just a way to, again, be more engaging, be more relevant to the buyer. OK, so my last topic, and perhaps my favorite, is how marketing evolves in this new world, engaging world, to become a more important part of the revenues, you know, revenue team. One of the implications of information abundance and people delaying you know, their engagement with sales is that people are somewhere between 65 to 90% of the buying process is complete before they want to talk to a sales rep, which means marketing now owns a much bigger piece of the revenue process than they did before. Right. I think that has the opportunity to elevate marketing, marketing's role in the organization. You know, it bothers me, this is my little soapbox, it bothers me that marketing at many organizations is perceived as a cost center, right? It's subservient to sales. Or marketing is seen as the people who make color brochures and throw parties, right? Marketing, I think, has the opportunity to use this new world where we need to be more engaging and more data-driven in our marketing to elevate ourselves and earn an equal seat at the revenue table. And that's kind of one of the things, some stuff I want to talk about, you know, for the last couple of minutes here. 
So it's about ROI, right? At the end of the day, your CEO doesn't care about the, the you know, what subject line got the best open rate. They care what subject line got the most revenue, right? They don't care about vanity metrics or how many Twitter followers you have. They care about are you getting ROI. So it's important to use, you know, one of the things if you're going to achieve that equal seat at the revenue table is to have the right, use the right metrics. ROI has two pieces, obviously, return and investment. You know, first talking about the investment side of things, you know, we used to do this on a spreadsheet. And, you know, many organizations track their, their investment on a spreadsheet. As, as a sidebar, I think it's important to point, that I'm, point out that I am talking about investment and not spending or cost. And that is on purpose semantically. Right? I think one of the things that marketers do that's the most detrimental to us individually is to talk about cost and spending. To tell people, oh, my cost per lead is X. Right? That is detrimental because we're telling people we're a cost center. Right? When we say I am spending and I have cost. And what do people do to cost centers? Right? They take costs out. When you instead talk about investment, I'm investing in this program. I would like to make more investment in marketing next year. Right? You're telling people that this is something that's going to deliver a return and that's worth putting investment into if you can show that return. So that's another part of my soapbox. Investment. Track your investment. You know, spreadsheets are fine, but they get very limited over time in terms of a complex multi-global organization. You know, and you end up with that you know, issue at the end of every quarter or every month, like how much do you have? What's the budget? What have we actually spent? What invoices have come in? So it's important to just make sure you're tracking your investment accurately, so you know what you have left and what ties to each program. Fundament my point, though, is fundamentally, if you have the right processes and systems, investment's not hard to track. Return is, right? And return is very hard, especially in this new world where content is mattering more and things have less direct touches, right? People don't buy because of one thing. You know, um, there's seven touches. Success has many parents, as we just heard. And there are multiple people on a given account. So the first thing you need to do when you're thinking about measuring return is just literally track all the touches. You know, there's an exercise I've seen marketers at almost every organization do at some point, which is when a sales closes a deal, the marketer manually goes in and figures out all the things that marketing did to influence that deal, right? And it probably takes a day of manual work to figure that out, you know, all these marketing touches. And then they say, hey, look what I did, right? We supported that deal, you know, by X. Right? That's fine, but you need a better system. You need a way to really be able to do that consistently because I think the way that you then want to track ROI is, you know, like, like in this example we're looking at here, you, you know, first touch is a way that a lot of people are used to doing. You're going to give credit to the place where you met the deal, the lead source, you know, if you will. I think a more sophisticated way to do it is what we call multi-touch, which is once you can track all those touches, you take the value of the deal, either the revenue or the pipeline, and you spread it. You allocate it across each of those different marketing interactions. All right? And then when you want to say the ROI of a program is you add up all the value that that program got from all the different accounts that it influenced, and you know what the return from that account was. This is some of our real data from Marketo. Just to kind of illustrate the difference between what I mean by first touch and multi-touch, the bottom axis is first touch pipeline, the vertical axis is pipeline with the other allocation of multi-touch. And what you see is that different kinds of programs work better for different types of, you know, of those things. Stuff on the bottom right, like marketing, prospecting, referral, and sales outbound is good for meeting new people. Stuff on the upper left, like nurture emails and webinars are a little bit better for meeting or nurturing and developing people, but fundamentally nothing is exclusively one or the other. This chart is usually very popular when I present it. Um, it's the money chart. It's got actual money. Um, and, it, and it shows our own, again, this is our real data. For each of the different various marketing channels that we can run, what did we invest in that channel? How many opportunities did that channel create from the first touch allocation? How many from the multi-touch allocation? And then where appropriate, my favorite number, I call it the marketing golden ratio, is the, the, the pipeline created from multi-touch divided by the investment. Right? I told you guys I was a physics major, so I should have warned you to be a lot of numbers. Right? But that number, that marketing golden ratio, to me is one of the most important metrics a marketer can use to measure 
improve effectiveness. For us, because it's, you know, is my investment returning pipeline? For us, the, you know, magic numbers, if it's above 9 or 10, that's great. We want to do as many, anything that gets above 9 or 10, we should do more of. Go find budget. Anything above 7 is worth doing. Anything below 5, we're probably losing money on. Now, your ratios might not be the same, depending on your cost structure and ASP and all that. Those are our numbers. And then the last column I have here shows of all the programs that we run in that channel, what percentage of unique programs came in above that threshold of five, of a ratio of five, you know, i.e. where the money was wasted. Just by lucky chance, you see, so 52% of our programs come in above five, right, or the, the, the minimum threshold. So, so half my marketing is wasted, right? The difference is, in this case, I actually know which half. So as a marketing manager, the job is to always be managing the marketing investment like a portfolio and you know, optimizing the mix, not putting everything into one channel, but the mix, and always be getting better and better over time. The other piece about being a revenue driver is to get good about tracking and measuring your impact on the overall revenue funnel. It's not ROI of a program, but net aggregate impact. So this is what our revenue cycle looks like. Um, it basically goes from new names, names that get engaged, to qualified targets, to leads, opportunities, you know, and so on. People can get deferred and recycled and so on. But we keep track of how people move through each stage. And that gives us, you know, a dashboard that I like to think of as like my Google Analytics for revenue. So for each of those key stages, what's my balance or my reach? How many people do I have in that stage? That's a really key indicator of you know, where people, you know, of my future opportunity. What's my flow, movement from stage to stage, my conversion rate, my velocity, how do those vary by business? This is incredibly valuable data to have as a marketer because when it comes time to set your budget, what we're all doing right now for 2014, right, we can use that data to work backwards through a model like this one to, that shows, you know, if I need this many deals then, what do I need to be doing at each prior stage? When you can justify your budget this way, right, again, you, you have incredible power to defend it. Somebody says, I need to take 10% out of marketing. You can say, well, okay, but that will have this impact on revenue five months from now or six months from now, right? So again, using the numbers to, just like a salesperson talks about their pipeline and, and all that, to gain credibility. And at the, most, the single most powerful thing you can do is to then make forecasts. Because right? if you go to a board meeting, the board cares a little bit about what happened. They really care about what will happen. And that's why sales usually get such a prominent role, because they're the one making the forecast. But marketing increasingly can also make forecasts by using the metrics and the numbers I've talked about. And then you know, each month, like I'm showing here, show how your forecast is changing and giving credibility to your forecasts. When you can do this kind of forecasting, Right. You're not an arts and crafts marketer. You're not just the people who throw parties. You, you, are rev you, know, you have an equal seat at the revenue table. And frankly, I think that's what I want everybody to aspire to. So we're at, we're at, we're at the end of the presentation. I have some key tweetable takeaways up here. Would you like to do a quick Q&A or, or wrap? OK. So thank you very much, everybody, at, at the end of the conference. I really appreciate your time. I'll stick around a little bit if you want to grab me for any additional questions. And I'll leave one extra book up here for somebody who wants to grab it. Thank you. Thank you.